I want to talk to you about the imagination as a place, and I want to talk about to individuals um, about their own creativity. And I don't really like that word creativity because it sort of insinuates that some people have been born with this gene, you know, the kind of artist gene, and other people don't have it. I don't have much imagination. I mean, I am an artist. You know, when I was listening to the guy talking about football as a thing, I was thinking I would have been stuck. Because I'm a big stiffy. I'm the person that was last to be picked out for any team, you know. Um, so that's probably why I went inside my head. Um, I want to talk today about the imagination as a place. Um, you know, I don't actually have much imagination. That's a weird thing to say, maybe, for somebody who is supposed to be my, um, my, uh, my trade, really. Um, but I don't have imagination. I've got some observation. And I've got some um, memory. And in some ways, there's no difference between memory and imagination. You only have to talk to your brother or sister about some event, and you realize you've got a totally different view of it. You were both there, you're both remembering, you're both telling the truth, but your imagination has created a different thing. And uh, people, you know, um, people have been saying to me all my life, oh, I really want to write, you know. I want to write. Once I retire, you know, I'll do some writing. Um, I've got this, I've been thinking about it for ages. Or somebody says, once my exams are over this summer, I'm going to write this, you know, I'm going to try and write this song that I want to write. Or once this or that's over, I will write. When people say to me they want to write, I say, well, why haven't you? You know, <laughs> where's your Bible? Where's your daughter? We don't need computers. We don't need um, anything special. Um, it's writing it down and taking responsibility for it. I'm not asking everybody to become a genius, you know, um, or to get published or, you know, to become um, a J.K. Rowling and the biggest, um, the, the biggest earner in, in Britain and in, in writing forever, which is a bit of a poison chalice for her in some ways as well, you know. I mean, I'm sure she would have quite liked a wee while being moderately successful before her whole life changed completely. We've been like winning the pools, isn't it? You know, I don't really want to, you know. But it's all right, I'm not going to win the lottery because I don't enter. <laughs> like my friend Alistair Gray said to me once, I'm not enough of an optimist to gamble. <laughs> um, but when people say to me they want to write, I say, well, hi, why haven't you? Pick up thy biro and write. I do you want to write? Now, this will sound daft. My first bit of advice to you is, Read. Read a lot. Um, read things that you like. Don't read to pass your exams. Don't read, don't read a poem as if it's a code, as if it's a special you know, thing written. There's just some people like me write these things to try and make people miserable. <laughs> I write things for the same reasons and that they've got to work out a hard code. You know, some people actually write me these questions about my poems and I sort of say, it's about what is... I said it was about in the poem, you know, <laughs> you know, funnily enough, that kind of thing. Um, but read a lot for pleasure. My favourite writer in the world is a woman called Alice Munro. She's been my favourite writer forever. She's a great, great short story writer. She's Canadian and she's, I think she's maybe stopped writing now because she's quite old. She's in her 80s. But she says that, of course, she writes brilliantly about people. She just knows more about human beings than Shakespeare, really, to me. Um, uh, she's just fantastic. But she says that what made her right was not just, it was not her interest in people, but she has an enormous interest in people and in life. She said it was her interest in reading things. So it's a combination of these two things. So read for pleasure. You know, don't read to pass exams. Um, go to the Poetry Library, if you're in Edinburgh, but a lot of people listen to me won't be in Edinburgh, you can go to the Poetry Library, browse on the shelves, look for the poems that you like. You don't have to know why you like it, but if you like it, start reading that one. Read a lot if you want to write. All the other good, you know, um, read for pleasure. Um, uh, interest in language and writing um, is the thing that makes you want to write. Um, 
Uh, you, can you can experience a great deal of pleasure out of reading. That is a creative act in itself. And I want to sort of, yeah, it is, but you're not trying to pass exams with it and suffering over it, you know. There is not a set of right answers that come out after reading a poem. There's what you made of it. Read the things that you like and read more of them, and your taste will improve and expand. It's like with music or anything else. You know, getting a wee bit of interest in something increases. So all the good advice about writing is very, very simple. It's all so straightforward. It's all been said before many times by so many people. Um, it will be good for you. It will be good for your head if you manage to write down something. Um, it will be, you know, but that's, I, yes, I'm a professional writer. I've been writing for a living for 40 years now, nearly. Yep, it is. Yeah. Um, and I've made some sort of living, sometimes broke and sometimes a bit better off. It's been up and down. So but I still, I don't do it for therapy, but it is very therapeutic to me. I know that because at the times when I can't write or it's not working very well, I feel rotten about everything. Um, the things I want to tell you are all very straightforward, and yet they're the things that I've got to tell myself every time I'm doing something. So I'm not talking down to anybody here and treating you like a beginner. You've got to become a beginner every time you start again. Um, this is the first. This is my number one. Write what really interests you. Write about what you think is the most interesting thing in the world um, to you at the moment. It might just be a wee thing you've noticed. But write what interests you, not what you think you should be interested in. You know? Uh, be honest with yourself, and if you're really deeply honest with yourself about what interests you, you have got the right to write about something that people have written about forever. Um, but, you know, you've got the right to write about it the way you see it, which is different from the way anybody else has seen it before. Not because you're a genius, just because every human being is different. Um, be honest with yourself and give yourself the permission to tell lies to tell the truth. Uh, the old five senses. You don't write with your brain box. You don't. You don't write having swallowed a dictionary. You write with your five senses. Those simple five senses. See it, touch it, taste it, smell it, hear it. There's another one. Turn yourself into it, said Ted Hughes, the former poet laureate. One, two, away. Um, Turn yourself into it, and then the words will look after themselves. You get right inside the thing you're writing about. I know that I've got to turn off all my sensors, you know, all the things that say, well, I can't write that about that. So I've got to give myself 100% permission. It's only going down the biro. I don't have to show it to anybody anyway. Um, but I still have to give myself permission. And I've also got to turn off my ego, my sense of myself, I'm the National Poet of Scotland, you know. Um, I should be able to write well about this. Um, this is going to be good because I'm a real writer. I've got to turn off that ego. I've got to write as another hero of mine, Isaac Dennison, whose real name was Karen Blixen. Um, she said she wrote every day without hope and without despair. That was a wonderful thing. You know, despair was a kind of luxury as well. Um, I've got to turn off any attempts at being clever or fancy. Well, in the first, in the first draft at least, I might try and get clever as I can later on. <laughs> um, see, it's only when you read back what you've written down. The simplest thing. Tell yourself you're not writing it anyway. You're just gathering together some of the ingredients. Once you read back what you've written down in one of these things, one of these simple things, you can get, uh, you can get two for a pound out the pound shop. Um, uh, once you've written, you read back what you've written down, without thinking, just using your five senses, you'll find you've captured a bit of life in the language. There'll be an image, there'll be a wee detail. And that won't necessarily be the bit that really flowed easily when you were writing it. The bit that you thought, well, I'm getting somewhere here. Or that's a nice image for that. It'll be the wee bits that you were saying, I'll write this down for now. This will do for now. Often that bit you struggled over. In the end, just put down what we do. You know, that's sometimes the bit that gets the life. Um, uh, 2B, 
because um, that was number two was the five senses. But two B is the, um, the the ear for me, just my personal way into it. Um, a lot of poets, of course, be writing images, but the ear. I like listening to ordinary language, just the people speaking on the bus, the cliches that we use. I'm going to do a wee poem. Uh, this is the first poem I ever wrote, nearly, or maybe the second or third. It's a wee poem, but somebody that I met yesterday told me that she'd really liked it, and that made my day. Um, it's a wee poem called Poem for My Sister. My little sister likes to try my shoes, to strut in them, admire her spindle thin, 12 year old's legs in this season's style. She said they fit her perfectly, but wobbles on their high heels, they're hard to balance. I like to watch my little sister playing hopscotch, admire the neat hops and skips of her, their quick peck, never missing their mark, not overstepping the line. She is competent at piva. I try to warn myself about unsuitable shoes, point out my own distorted feet, the calluses, odd patches of hard skin. I should not like to see her in my shoes. I wish she could stay sure-footed, sensibly shod. When you read back what you've written, throw away all the bits that don't have that bit of life in them. You know, that would be 90% of it. It doesn't matter. Keep the wee surprisingly real or surprisingly honest and vivid bits. The bits that to tell the truth surprise you, maybe by their simplicity. And start all over again with them in your next draft. Hopeful I have written down here, don't explain. Don't tell somebody what that meant. I don't have to say, oh, that's a poem about how an older person feels, you know, uh, protective to a younger person. I've dramatised the incident. If you can't make head or tail of it, tough, you know, uh, <laughs> something wrong with you, you know, all that stuff, you know. <laughs> don't explain. You don't have to give your reasons for going there with that thing. Consider cutting off the beginning and the end of what you've written. We often vamped already, you know, put in a wee bit, explaining, you know, what it's going to be about later. Um, what was it? Aristotle, I think he said, uh, in medias res, he didn't say it like that, he said it in Greek, but that was a, a Latin <laughs> translation of it. He was said it in Greek, but um, the Latin translation means in the middle of things. You know, keep the middle, throw away the beginning, throw away the summing up. Uh, don't end up with a moral or message. Trust your reader, you're right there, to, right there with you. Get in, get out, don't linger, said Raymond Carver, another hero of mine. Number five, this is an important one. Don't try and describe your feelings. Never put down your feelings. Don't say, I was terrified, it was beautiful, this or that. No abstract nouns. An emotion named is an emotion obliterated from any text. If you stick to your five sound senses, stick to objects and actions, what's done, what's said, what happens, get this right and all the feeling in the world will be there. It's all in the details. It's all in the particular. The two out loud and live TED uh, talks that I heard this afternoon were full of concrete examples of things. You know, we can't live by generalities. We need the pictures. We need the stories to make it all make sense to us. But it might be a small wee thing that somebody's noticed that makes me come alive and laugh. Plain words, probably. Which ones? That's the thing. Now, I said this was very, very simple. I never, ever said it was easy. <laughs> Number seven, this is the most important. Enjoy yourself. Next, struggle with not enjoying yourself because you don't. When you really do it for a living, you're not enjoying yourself all the time. Um, I've got a friend who used to teach me at art school and uh, he's now become a very good friend. And, uh, uh, he struggles like mad, and he's a wonderful painter. But, you know, he showed me in, the, um, in his studio the other week for the first time, and he said, oh, God, I'm really struggling with these ones just now. I found that hard to believe. But he genuinely had been struggling, not enjoying himself for a week. And what I say is, struggle with not enjoying yourself until you begin to. 
enjoy yourself very much when it starts to come alive. If I can't enjoy myself with something I'm working on, it's usually because I'm not obeying rule number one. Rule number one was uh, be honest about what you're really interested in. Be honest. Tell yourself you're allowed to be interested in that. Some random good bits of advice, Margaret Atwood says, if you're stuck with something you're writing, if it's in the first person, that is if it's an I speaking, turn it into the third person. Say he or she. If it's already in the third person, if it's he or she, or even in the second person, you do this, you do that, you do the next thing. That's got a kind of creepy effect. He says, she says, if you're stuck with something, just change first person into third person, or third person into first person. If it's in the past tense, write it in the present tense. I was thinking after why she said that, and I think it's to make you footer around with it without there being much at stake. You know, your ego not to be at stake for sure anyway. Um, Jim Trace, another writer I admire a lot, he said, yep, he says, you're always telling you to write what you know. And he says a wonderful thing. He says, write what you don't know. <laughs> You'll find out what you know. Um, if you really want to get at your own feelings, write about not being yourself. Put, you know, put yourself in somebody else's shoes or in the, the, the piece of, piece, be a piece of landscape. Be something inadequate, inadequate. You know, don't be scared to write the life story of a penny that we did at school in my day, and I don't think it means much to any of you, but they did, they did used to do that. All the pennies in everybody's class always ended up in my public toilet. <laughs> but there. Anyway, but you know, write what you don't know, and I'm going to finish up um, with a tiny wee poem about something I don't know personally about myself, you know, at all. But I was putting myself in somebody else's shoes. And to my great delight, some people in various different um, uh, bad situations or people who are uh, part of organisations fighting their way outside of them, the kind of things we've heard about, you know, from football, hope, um, and things like that. Um, this wee poem, it's just a wee poem called Listen. And I've got it here, but I know it off my heart anyway. I do. Yeah. I know it, but I'll get it ready just in case. <laughs> Listen. Trouble is not my middle name. It is not what I am. I was not born for this. Trouble is not a place. Though I am in it, deeper than the deepest would. And I'd get out of it. Who wouldn't? If I could. Hope is what I do not have in hell. Not without good help now. Could you listen, listen hard and well to what I cannot say except by what I do? And when you say I do this for badness, this much is true. I do it for badness done to me before any badness that I do to you. Hard to unthank all this, but you can help me, maybe. Loosen all these knots and really listen. I cannot plainly tell you this, but if you care, then beyond all harm and hurt, real hope is there. Thank you very much for listening to me today.